Hey, hey, it's good to be back. The House of AC live streaming once again. I have taken a bit of a break to get some other projects off the ground, but I left you with so much content when I was doing this every single day. You know, I didn't feel too bad. I mean, I missed you guys, but I, I you had a lot of content to catch up on, right? So I was doing you a favor. But today we're back and I'm excited to live stream once again. And also thanks for tuning in on the podcast because we have a very special guest today. Um, when it comes to real estate investing, right? There, there's parts of it that I love and, uh, and, and I just get really excited about. And then just like everything, there's parts that I don't necessarily is like what I wake up in the morning thinking about. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, I'm sure you're, my listeners are different than me, but I, I love finding the deal. I love negotiating the deal. I love figuring out the financing, getting the creative, the, the acquiring a property, um, that, that is, that's the high, that, that hits the most dopamine, uh, pulses for me. And I understand I've got to do all the other stuff. Like once I acquire it, you got to do the property management. You've got to, you know, deal with the tenants and, and, and all that stuff. Um, but the one part that I do not enjoy at all is the taxes, right? The, the tax strategy, the tax planning, the, the going through the details of the, the, the spread book the spreadsheets and the, you know, the QuickBooks or whatever you have to, you know, do your taxes in the year, which is why I outsource it all the time. This is something that I'm like, this is not my specialty. I'm always going to outsource it. So that is what we're going to bring on the show is someone who lives and breathes and dreams about this tax stuff and is super successful about it, written multiple books about tax planning for real estate investors. Amanda Hahn is going to be joining us today. If you don't know her, you've probably seen her work uh, online, writing for many magazines. I first got, uh, she's been on multiple Bigger Pockets podcasts, which is uh, where I first learned about Amanda and got her book. And let's just bring her in and let's start talking taxes. And I promise you, her passion is going to come through. This is going to be exciting stuff. And I'm going to learn a thing because I've always buried my hand, head in the sands uh, for when it comes to taxes. So uh, this, this, there's going to be a lot of questions that I'll personally that I've always had and wanted to ask. So I'm really forward to this show. For those of you just tuning in, thank you for watching the House of AC. You can follow along. We're live streaming on YouTube and Twitch. If you want to leave comments, we can ask questions during the show. Please do so. Um, if you're watching this later, you can watch this later on YouTube and also on, uh, I think it's live streaming on Twitter as well. Um, so, oh, the podcast, we also got it on the podcast, wherever podcasts are. So please like and subscribe. Tell me all your comments and let's get going on the House of AC. Welcome to the show, Amanda. Hi, I'm so glad to be here on the House of AC. So excited um, to see if I can change your mind and not dread taxes, but have that be one of your favorite parts of being a real estate investor too. I, it should be my favorite part because it's so financially, like I'm, I'm usually financially motivated. Like oh, I see yeah. the, oh, I can make so much money off this property. I should have that same excitement. I can save so much money with my with appropriate tax planning, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we're, we're going to be here to change your mind and tell you all the great things and why you should be looking forward to tax season every year instead of, like you said, dreading it or burying your head in the sand. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so what are some mistakes that maybe some new or maybe any any real estate investors that you see time and time again are, are possibly doing on their taxes? Gosh, um, you know, I think uh, one of the common mistakes that we see a lot is people not really understanding what they can write off as an investor. Um, so I think, you know, investors are, are pretty good at writing off, you know, common rental property related things like property tax or mortgage interest, or if you have a property manager, you know, whatever you're paying them. But, but what a lot of people miss out on are a lot of these overhead expenses relating to real estate investing. Um, you know, people always hear, there's always talks of like, hey, you know, in the US, you want to be a business owner. And when you're a business owner, you get all these write offs, right? Um, and so the truth is, as a real estate investor, we are also business owners in the eyes of the IRS, which means that as business owners, we also can um, are able to write off a lot of these overhead expenses, like um, when you're using your car for real estate investment, you know, driving around to look at properties, driving to, to go to the bank, go to a local real estate meetup, 
um, you know, our home office expense, part of our cell phone, laptops, and all those things. So as real estate investors, um, it's really important to keep in mind that we are also business owners when it comes to taxes. So when you hear people talk about all the write-offs that business owners get, they all apply to real estate investors as well. So don't miss out on those things. So does let's let's say someone who is working a nine to five, they've got a W-2 you know, on salary, and they bought maybe one or two rental properties under their own name, and they never formed an LLC. Is, are these still a business and business write-offs? Yeah, that's such a great question because that's probably one of the most common um, misunderstandings that people think. Um, I always have people coming to us saying, hey, Amanda, you know, I heard you on a podcast and, and I want to write all these things off, but I, I don't have an LLC yet. Um, so it's really important to understand that uh, as investors, we are business owners with or without a legal entity. What you described an LLC or a partnership or a corporation, they're legal entities. That's all that means. It doesn't mean it's an actual business. And um, so for investors, whether or not we have a legal entity does not impact our ability to write things off. So yeah, you can just be someone who has a full-time job. Um, you have one or two rental properties just in your personal name. You can write off the same exact things that another investor who might hold their rental in an LLC, right? You can write off this pretty much the same exact things. So let's talk about what a write-off is, because I think um, a lot of people think of a write-off saying, hey, I made $2,000 profit in rental income, but I had $2,000 of business expenses that I can write off. Is that is that one-to-one? -one? Was that basically show up as zero uh, income for that month? Yeah, exactly. So if um, a write-off will off offset the income directly dollar for dollar. So if I had rental income of $100, and I paid my property manager $100, then my net taxable is actually zero. Okay. So I would assume most people have a car. Uh, how would they say, well, and, and let's say I've got one rental property. How could I write off my car or phone or internet? Some of the examples that you give to get some of that one-to-one -one write off to reduce my quote unquote income, you know, and, and save on some taxes. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the car first, right? For, for most investors, if you're not a full-time investor, um, you're probably going to use your car for personal as well as real estate. And so if you have a mixed use car, the way it works is you should be tracking your miles during the year to figure out how many miles are business miles and business miles, again, driving to the bank, driving to a local real estate meetup or to your property or look for properties, right? Those are business miles. And um, you take your business miles compared with your total miles is what you arrive at business use percentage. So maybe you're using your car 20% for business or uh, yeah, let's just say 20% for business. That means you can take a deduction for 20% of your total car expenses for the year. So 20% of your gas, 20% of your repairs and oil change and maybe, um, you know, depreciation and things like that. Um, so that will be for most investors who are not doing a real uh, real estate full time. But those who are doing a real you know real estate full time or have a lot of rental properties, we do sometimes have clients who are writing off a hundred percent of a particular car. You know, if you had a bought a pickup truck that you're using just to rehab your properties, for example, right? Mm -hmm. That's a little bit easier because you don't necessarily have to track miles anymore. You can write off the entire car in that example. As, and I know sometimes it's the weight of the car gives you different benefits. Is that does that apply here as well? Yeah. So um, right now we have what's called bonus depreciation, which means you can write off up to 100 percent on the purchase price of a car um, based on the business use. So a, a simple example, you pay fifty thousand dollars for a large car. So that's a truck or SUV frame um, over six thousand pounds. If you use the 100 percent for business, you can write off 100 percent of that purchase price. So very powerful for um, you know people who are like using large cars for a vehicle like rehabbing properties and things like that. So I, I want to dig deeper in this just to, to, to solidify this point. So a lot of people who work, who don't, are not real estate investors, thinking about getting real estate investors, maybe they have a, a nine to five job, a W-2, they make $100,000 and they go buy a fancy new pickup truck for $60,000. They save, save, save. That $100,000 is already taxed by the government. And then they go buy, they, they put it in a pool and they go buy a $60,000 car. Now, imagine you take that $60,000, you go buy a real estate uh, and, and that real estate generates you 
one, there, there's multiple ways to do it. What I teach in house fire is take that $60,000. And let's say you go, it makes you a, a down payment. You make in a thousand bucks a month, that thousand dollars a month could pay off your car note, but you could also save up that thousand dollars a month for, for 60, for five years, save $60,000. And instead of paying taxes and all that, you go buy a new truck and it's, Oh, I made sixty thousand dollars. I just spent sixty thousand dollars for a business expense. I'm paying no taxes. Um, am I am I right there? Is there other ways to think about that? Yes. Well, yes and no. So the concept of it uh, makes sense. However, in the tax world, nothing is ever as simple as it seems. So, so yes, for someone who buys a car, you know, in, in a simplistic world, if that's all they're doing, and real estate is kind of their full-time gig, um, and it's a large car, then yes, the entire purchase price will reduce the, you know, the other income that's being generated, or at least generated from the property. Um, but if it's someone that's doing it part-time, or if the car is, you know, not 100% business use or okay. under the weight limit, you still get a benefit, right? It just not be as, um, you know, as sexy as a $60,000 write-off, but it might be a $10,000 write-off or it might be a $20,000 write-off. Um, so again, depending on, you know, how much business use you have, what your other income is, how much or how little you're actually doing in real estate. But yeah, I think that's where you see a lot of the, you know, the people who are doing a ton of real estate when they say, oh, I made so much money in real estate and I paid zero taxes, right? That's yeah. kind of like the ultimate goal. But for investors who are starting out, even if we don't get to zero tax, but let's say we made, um, you know, ten thousand dollars cash flow this year and we pay no taxes on it, versus maybe our W two where we're paying thirty seven percent tax, right. that's still a win, right? So yeah. you have to start right. somewhere, start small, and of course we like no tax, but if we can even save five ten thousand dollars, that's still a great deal. Oh yeah, totally. Um, it's, it's a coupon on a, on a new car or whatever you're buying you can apply it to your wardrobe your haircuts as far as i correct me if i'm wrong you know how about like dinner dinner out so you're taking client quote unquote clients out to talk real estate is that yeah definitely definitely taking um clients potential investors that you might be working with right if you want to take your cpa out to dinner that's also good too yeah yeah <laughs> i like so so this is what i think like there's no like fact check. Like wh where's the gray line? Like, like obviously some people are really taking out investors every single night for, for, for dinner. Some of them are taking out their family every single night. Right. Where, where do you draw the line to say, you know, can you prove that you talk to real estate? Like, how does that, how, how do you walk that line? Yeah. It always comes down to documentation. So um, before going out to dinner, before going to a meal or to an event, you want to have some way to substantiate it. Right. And now we're in the world of, you know, everything is done electronically, email, text, um, things, you know, chats online. So those are the things that you just want to make sure you have a screenshot or it's somewhere in history where if you're audited, you can pull those things up and help to substantiate that that was indeed real estate related, right? Because okay. in the, I mean, in the tax world, essentially, um, you're guilty until proven innocent. What I mean by that is the IRS says, hey, you went for a nice steak meal, you said it was business related, but it's not until you prove to me that it was otherwise. And that's why it's important to say, okay, well, how do I go back and, and make sure I substantiate that? Was it an email I sent to this person? Was it a text message? And being able to pull up that information if you're ever audited. Or just have a digital calendar that you don't, you know, you can refer back to for all your meetings. Um, that, that's sort mm -hmm. of how I, I play it. Yeah. Um, and no one's ever asked because I haven't been audited, uh, knock on wood. So I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm not raising any alarm so far. Yeah. And uh, you don't want to be audited. And, you know, it's always yeah. the goal to not be audited. Even if you win an audit, just the process of it, you know, is very time consuming. And it could be costly if you have a CPA who's going to help you or even a tax attorney helping you. Um, and what we've seen is when people are audited, they're sort of on a um, like a VIP list or non VIP list, if you will. Um, where they're more likely to be audited again, even oh. if that first audit was a what we consider a clean audit with no change. Yeah. Somehow you're kind of on this, you know, frequent flyers list. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, the suspicious ones. You're always suspicious. Kind of. <laughs> um, okay, so how about now? We've covered why you can get these tax benefits without forming an LLC, but yeah. a lot of new real estate investors. Or they just have it in their head. They're not going to invest until they start an LLC, which there's obviously pros and cons with that. And I've covered that in the past. But 
Are there any sort of tax related pros uh, or, or cons that, you, that that creating and buying in an LLC name that you can kind of discuss? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, for rental investors, right, landlords, whether it's a single family, duplex, multifamily, um, you know, again, you can write off the same things. You're using the same strategies with or without an LLC. But the reason people have LLCs mainly um, is for asset protection. Um, so that's outside of what, you know, I strategize on, but that is a team effort that we typically work with. So it'll be us as a CPA, as well as an attorney to look at whether that's needed. A lot of times it's based on um, how much equity do you have in the property? What your risk tolerance level is? Um, but one of the benefits of for forming it before purchasing a property would be that you can buy it in the name of the LLC, possibly. You, then you don't have to transfer a title you know, later on. Um, but one of the downsides is the cost and complexity. So what you're saying is like, hey, you know, investors not ready to pull the trigger and actually invest until an LLC is formed. Um, you know, sometimes it's kind of hiding behind that, right? I've, I've had people who say, oh, I'm ready to do it. I'm just waiting for the perfect name yes. for my LLC. And I said, no, that's ridiculous. <laughs> you need to look at properties and make offers. That's yes. how we're going to make money. Not with a wonderful LLC name, right? It that, sounds that like you've heard that. a bumper sticker or a t-shirt because like so many times it's like, First of all, you can have the most creative name. No one ever sees that name. Like, what's the name of the LLC of the rental house across the street? Like, no one knows. Like, only the tax, you know, property tax, uh, you know, government, when they send a bill, knows what that name is. And it's just a computer sending out an invoice. Like, you're not going to be advertising John's rental house or whatever. Like, yeah. it's... It, 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 the easiest thing is just name it the address, 123 Main Street, LLC. And then uh, you know, all your accounting is a little bit easier. But um, yeah, so many people hung up on the LLC thing. Um, and uh, do you have a recommendation when someone should should be thinking yeah. about that asset protection? Is that a, a price point, a comfort level, a, a period of their life? Or, or what's your... Yeah. I mean, there? I think it's, you know, for me, because as a CPA, right, I have to look at the money side of it. So I'm always looking at a cost benefit and saying, okay, what is it going to cost for you to form an LLC? Are you going to do it online? Are you going to have an attorney? Whatever that cost is going to be. And then is that justified by whatever the benefit is, right? The, the asset protection part, how much equity are we protecting? And is, a, is that justified by my cost of not just forming the entity, but paying the state fees every year, paying a CPA every year just to possibly file a tax return mm -hmm. um, and all those, because, you know, especially for newer investors, our goal is to get cash flow. And what you don't want to do is have decent cash flow, but have a big chunk of that taken away by the attorneys and the CPAs and, you know, whoever it is right. with all these different fees. So it's going to be very specific to the individual. But I think one of the starting points, like I said, is the equity, you know, for newer investors who are doing like low to no money down, maybe a risk is very small, right? I'm not going to spend, yeah. you know, five, ten thousand dollars on these attorneys to form these LLCs when I don't really need too much, don't have too much yet to protect. Um, but you have another investor whose first property, they have 50, 100,000 or more in equity, or they just have a lot of other assets that I might form it sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. But I like what you were saying about the name. So it, it is easy to say, hey, my LLC that holds 123 Main Street, I'll name it 123 Main Street LLC. But we typically tell our clients not to do that, at least not the, you know, the 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 number and the address. Yeah. Because one of the reasons have an LLC is for privacy as well, right? <laughs> you yeah. don't want people to like, oh, search up Amanda Hahn and find all of my real estate. And um, and so one of the things is to 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 consider maybe not using a full address. It could be, you know, a Main Street stays or main street housing or something, right? But at least right. it's not so specific um, that it's the full address. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah. And then, so what's the structure? Like, should every property have its own LLC? Do you have a holding LLC at the very top that all of these sort of fall under? What do you recommend? Or is that a case by case recommendation on, on the investor? Yeah, somewhat of a case by case as well. Um, and this really, from a tax perspective, is going to be dependent upon what state you live in as well as what state you're investing in, because every state has their own different law as well in terms of the fee structure, what tax returns you need to file. So um, so I'm in California. California, as an example, super expensive to have LLCs. Every LLC, you have to pay the state $800. So if you envision you know, one LLC per property with the holding on the top, 
you're talking about a lot of fees, right? Before we even make any money, here's right. all the money already going out. Um, versus you're in another state, maybe like in Arizona or Nevada, then they don't have the annual state taxes that they have to worry about, in which case, yes, one of those structures with an umbrella on top is really, really great because you can separate out all the the risks with the baby LLCs, but also just have a consolidation at the top of the holding company. So these are the kinds of things to talk to your tax advisor about, you know, before uh, one of the other mistakes I see is investors will, who are super excited to get into real estate, they'll go out and form all these LLCs, right? We talked about people not doing it. And then yeah. we talked about the other side of just overdoing it, um, where they'll, you know, by the time I see them, it's like, hey, I formed five LLCs and this is supposed to do this and this is supposed to do that. But right now they're not doing anything. Um, so you want to avoid that as well, right? Too much complexity before you actually need all of that. So it start out small, you know, one rental, start with an LLC, and then you add on to it as your portfolio grows. Right. And and if you're starting out, every dollar counts. And so like like you said, it's it's cheaper to just do it in your name and you still get the tax benefits. So it's going to be cheaper to get a mortgage. It's, you can just file the tax. You don't have to do a separate taxes uh, if it's just in your name. And then when you have those assets to protect, like you said, you got $100,000 in equity or the house really went up in value. Then you could say, okay, let's do a quick claim deed, move it over to an LLC and go from there. And I would imagine... Yeah, depending on your state, whether you group multiple rentals under one LLC or, or create different LLCs for each property that sort of fits that mold. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, how many properties per LLC will be a decision made by you as the investor and your attorney, right? Because if you were to get called, I mean, if you were to get sued, yeah. who that's who you call, you'll be calling your attorney. Um, on yeah, on our end, it's just, you know, one of the key things I would say for investors, okay, the reason we always talk about LLCs is because an LLC is very flexible when it comes to the tax world. What we mean by that is you can own in your individual name, transfer it to an LLC. You don't, you're not worried about income taxes. If at some point you decide, oh, it's not going to be in this LLC, I want to actually put it in a separate structure because I've grown my portfolio now. When you move it out of the LLC into your personal name again or to a different LLC, also no income tax issues there. So very flexible, allows you to move it back and forth, um, which you cannot do or there's limitations with that if you're holding real estate in a corporation. So the one key thing on the tax side is don't hold appreciating rental properties inside of a corporation. LLCs, partnerships, individual names, those are all okay for tax purposes. Okay. Okay. All right. That's interesting. Um, what are some other things that maybe that you see could be a great way to save money uh, for a real estate investor that, that we haven't discussed yet? Well, I mean, um, depreciation is, yeah. you know, one of the biggest benefits of, of real estate investing. You know, when we talked earlier about maximizing write-offs, those are a lot of the things that we're that, you know, we're spending money on, right? Our car and our home office and computers and things like that. But um, depreciation is the is the huge one for real estate because, you know, essentially the IRS allows you to take a write-off for a portion of the building purchase price uh, over 27 and a half years if we're talking about residential real estate. And so it's not uncommon for us to see at least the first couple of years of investing where an investor would have great cash flow but pay no taxes on the property because of depreciation and because of these other write-offs that they might be taking advantage of. And that's really the, the purpose of it, right? Is make more money while not having to pay more taxes on that money you generated. Right. So let's, let's, let's take this out like 30, 40, 50 years. And this may, kind of turns into estate planning, which I don't know if, if where, where you fall in with there, but what's the best sort of, way to leave property to your heirs if you're trying to build this you know uh, a mogul you know business or legacy income which a lot of these investors are are sort of that that's their, their lifetime goal like what what should they be aiming for and at least when they finish the race kind of yeah thing. when <laughs> yeah i like how you put it um <laughs> so you know that's also somewhat going to be investor specific right it's going to depend on what your goals are um as well as how much net worth you have. Uh, but one of the com most you know, common strategies we see 
is to effectively pass it down to the next generation upon death. So currently, uh, we have what's called a step-up basis, which means that let's say mom and dad bought a property for $100,000, right? They are taking write-offs. Actually, they take depreciation on the $100,000. And over the years, they've written everything off already. When they pass away, let's say now this home or this investment property is now worth $500,000, okay? If they leave that property to their kids and the kids are inheriting it upon their death, the kids get step-up basis, which means now the kids' basis in that property is $500,000. So when they sell this property, that first $500,000, they don't have to pay capital gains taxes on, right? So it's, and it's such a great strategy because the parents have utilized the benefits over their lifetime and also held it for appreciation this whole time. And when you pass it to the kids, it's almost like a tax-free, you know, a, a, a gift that's tax-free, right? If they, right. if they sold it for $600,000, let us say, then they would pay tax on the difference, which is $100,000. Um, still a great deal either way. So it seems like if you are, you shouldn't really just sell your property right before, because your kids don't want it uh, to like clean up your estate before you die. It seems like it's in your best interest to maybe just have a good will and probate and, or to avoid probate and just say, Hey, this is uh, um, sell this after I die. Cause you'll, you're going to save all the taxes. Is that? Yeah, 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 definitely. And I've seen some mistakes on that part as well. You know, when um, parents get more elderly um, then they, you know, decide, oh, I'm going to just quit claim the property to the kids, right? Because, right. you know, maybe parents can't handle it anymore. Um, that's almost the same as selling a property because w if you change ownership during life, the kids now own it. So when you pass away, there is no step up basis. So eventually yeah. when the kids sell, now they're looking at huge capital gains tax. So yeah, if possible, um, you know, sometimes it makes sense just to hold on to it until then. Okay. All right. Um, sorry to get a little morbid there, but I, uh, I think these are good <laughs> questions to ask. Yeah. People don't like to think about it. Right. But yeah. I mean, it's, it's going to happen. You know, we're all going to pass away at some point. So you just want to make sure all that stuff that you worked so hard your whole life to, you know, create, you want to keep as much of that for the kids or grandkids or just other family members as you can. Now, is there any sort of benefit for putting properties in a trust um, there's two different types of trusts that we typically see. I mean, you know, there's lots of trusts, but the two common ones we see, one is the called a land trust or title holding trust. Um, that really is not a tax strategy that is typically done for privacy purposes. So if someone goes to the county records, they're going to, they search up a property address, they're going to see Mickey Mouse land trust, right? And from there, they don't really know who owns it. They can't find the LLC. So it gives you more privacy. Um, the other one we typically see is the living trust and the living trust is a, it's a revocable living trust where, um, you know, you have your property held by the LLC and then the LLC is owned by your living trust or title held in the living trust. Um, and the benefit of that is um, that you can make changes to the trust anytime. So let's say you have three kids and you want them, you know, to have a third each. But at some point you change your mind. You say, okay, I wanted to go to the other two kids only. You can change that anytime during your life. Um, and, and it just basically helps you to avoid probate, right? Avoid the, the, the state having to make decisions on what happens to that asset if you pass away. So those are kind of the more common ones we see. Now, for someone who has a higher net worth, um, then they're looking at more, you know, advanced estate type of trust planning too. And so like so, sort of, I, I've always sort of like pushed a lot of this stuff off because it's like, well, I, I'm buying and selling like every month I'm selling this, I'm buying that I'm selling this. And I'm like, I, I don't want to constantly be updating a will or a trust or beneficiaries on like constantly. Um, and so it, is that something that would be good because revocable meaning I could edit it on the fly without too much trouble or, or what, what would you recommend in that situation? Yeah. I mean, so if you're, you're, if you're talking about buying and selling of rental properties or you're talking about flipping real estate. Uh, uh, prob for my specific purpose is rental properties, but yeah. yeah. So for rental properties, typically the way we see it is the rental be held by an LLC, right? The LLC. Mm -hmm. And so when you buy and sell, it's just the LLC is buying and selling. Yeah. The LLC will list the member to be your living trust. And so that doesn't change. Nothing oh. changes for the, the listing of the LLC. And then the trust will say you and, you know, we spouse, kids, whatnot. And that also doesn't change. So it does keep things pretty simple. 
um, because it's still just the LLC buying and selling, right? Which yeah. is what you're already doing. The yeah. owner of, of the LLC doesn't change. The details within the trust doesn't change unless you want it to. But yes, you could change it every deal or every time you want. Um, we just typically don't see that. So where do you put that trust? On the title or, or within the organization of the LLC? They're like a, a equal partner? Or? So the way it will be, so the um, the property will be held by the LLC, right? Title to the, the yeah. rental is the LLC. And then in the LLC operating agreement you file with the state, yes. it'll say who owns the LLC. So instead yeah. of Amanda yeah. Hahn owning the LLC, it would be Amanda Hahn's Living Trust. Got it. Got it. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Awesome. I, I, I know <laughs> that's been on my like to do list for a long time to, to work through that to, um, um, yeah. uh, to well, just to understand it. Like, what are my options? Like, I feel like I'm not I'm not thinking. Because what happens is I, I get a lot of deals from like retiring investors. Uh, yeah. And so they're like, my kids don't want anything to do with real estate. And and it's like, um, and like I bought like a 50 single family home portfolio and nice. it was all from retiring guys. And I was like, I bought it because it was cheap. They couldn't get rid of it, whatever. They did some seller financing. It was a really good deal. And then as soon as I acquired it, I was like, man, this is such a mess. My kids are not going to want to inherit this either. Like, <laughs> so then I'm like, what's my exit plan? Uh, and yeah. so uh, I, I keep having these thoughts whenever I'm like evaluating the deal. And so I'm like, yeah. do I try to simplify, sim make, make, I don't know the word. Simplify. Simplify, thank you. Uh, my investing moving forward or should I still just chase after every opportunity and uh, somehow I can, uh, through a trust or something, there's something, you know, because, um, you know, if, if you're not interested in real estate or you're 18 years old or 20 years old and you inherit, inherit 50 single family homes in a, another state or another city, like that, that's right. going to be completely overwhelming and mind boggling. And it'll probably just fall apart and be worth nothing because, you know, <laughs> you just threw a, a, all these things at someone. Of course, they're not set up for success. And so I, I think about yeah. that a lot. Yeah, we do see that quite a bit, you know, for um uh, people who are aging, like you said, who kind of, I mean, for us from a tax, purely from a tax perspective, right? It's a yeah. mistake to sell those before, um, you know, prior to death. But, um, you know, there's things you can do to put in place too. You know, we have clients who are like, okay, my kids aren't going to really, um, are going to take care of the property. We're, you know, they're going to want to sell it, but I have those uh, things in place already, right? Upon yeah. my death, I'm going to sell it to this company or this person. And we, everything's sort of pre-negotiated. We'll sell it at, um, you know, 2%, 3% under fair market value at that point in time. So everything's sort of set up where the kids don't have to be so involved or they don't have to become landlord to 50 right. houses all of a sudden. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, no, okay. So yeah, that's, that's all. That's, that's, that's very interesting. And it, it needs to be a, a thought process because what you're, yeah. like you said, you're, you're, you're buying a business. When, when you buy a house, you're buying a business. And then you yes. got to have an exit plan for that business at some point. Um, or, or a, you know, it, it's yeah. generating income in yeah. many ways. So. Yeah. And I love that you were sharing your story about uh, buying that large portfolio from seller, you know, seller financing deal, because we see that a lot too. We, I mean, we, we see it from both ends. We have kind of the aging investors who are just like, hey, I don't want to be property owner anymore. Um, I want to sell. But, you know, what are they going to do, right? They're going to pay a bunch in taxes. And then what are they going to do with the cash? They're not going to do stock market because all they've known their whole life is real estate. Right. So doing a seller financing is so great for them because they're still getting, you know, cash flow. It's in the form of interest and, and principal payments. And they understand the real estate. That's, that's the security of the, the deal. So right. they really love that they get to defer tax. And then from the buyer end for our young investors um you know what an awesome opportunity to get into these deals with very little money down the financing already in place and as the buyers we get um depreciation we get write-offs we get all the same thing just as we do with the traditional real estate deal so i, I do see that a lot too now are the fees of a cpa that you hire to look at your real estate portfolio are those a business write-off yeah, yeah, definitely, right? Definitely. So it almost to me it seems like why would a lot of people are like I want to save money, I'm going to do my own taxes. And I'm like, guys, just hire an expert who will probably save you more in taxes than you're aware of, but you can also write off that that accountant's fees as a business expense. And so it's 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 discounted in in many ways and uh to me it's why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you hire someone like yourself to to look over 
everything. Yeah, and I think a lot of um, a mistake that a lot of investors make is that um, you know they're not differentiating between tax return filing and proactive tax planning, right? So tax return filing is essentially when um, you know after January you get your W twos, you get all your state 1099s, 1098s. And then you take it or you send it off to your tax person and then they put all those numbers on a form and they basically tell you this is how much you owe or whatever refund you get, right? It's just reporting the facts of what already happened last year. Um, the planning, the proactive planning is a process that occurs during the year. So it's you talking with your tax advisor, um, strategizing, telling them what are you planning to do this year? Are you planning to get into real estate? How many properties are you planning on buying? In what states? What's your exit strategy? Um, and from those conversations, your tax person is going to give you a plan or an idea. Hey, here are the, some of the things you should be doing, you should consider doing. And if you did A, B, and C, it might save you X dollar amount in taxes, right? And and so um, the planning part is the, the more important part because without the planning, if you're going to talk to your tax person next April, the facts are the facts. Maybe you might have done something right to save taxes, but maybe you could have done something better, right? So it's always much better to plan rather than to be reactive at tax time. So let's, so I, I agree that every investor needs this planning. Is this a once a year exercise, once a quarter? How often are you reaching out to someone like yourself to do this real estate tax planning? Yeah. Um, I mean, you're probably going to hate the answer, but it's depend. it depends, right? <laughs> like every answer yeah. I've given, it's going to depend on the investor. And every investor will even be different with, with every year, too. So let's say this year you have a lot of deals going on. You're selling a lot of properties, reinvesting in other places. Then you might meet very often with your tax person because okay. um, maybe you're doing a 1031 exchange or, you know, who knows? Well, you want to know what your options are. Or you might be, or this might be a you know kind of a status quo year where okay, I've held my portfolio, not much else I'm doing, everything is pretty pretty much the same. I already have my plan in place. I know what's to expect. Then maybe you're only talking to them once or twice this year. Yeah. Um, so it just really depends on the transactions, you know, where you are in those transactions. But I think a lot of times too, people feel like planning. It just sounds very um, overwhelming. You know, people who hate taxes, like you were right, saying. Right, right. Um, it's like wow, it, it's almost like going to your dentist. Where I have to call yeah. your CPA and talk about all these number stuff. But really, the planning side for for you as an investor, right? The goal is not for you to learn and understand everything about taxes or how do we calculate depreciation. That's not your job. Your job really is to just have open communication with your CPA. It could be as simple as a two sentence email, right? Dear CPA, I'm thinking, I'm looking at Main Street property. Should I sell or refinance? Yeah, myself yeah. for three hundred thousand, right? And then they can run the numbers for you and say, okay, well, here are the different options. If you sell, let's consider A, B, and C to save taxes. Or if you refinance, let's consider you know X, Y, Z on how we're going to reuse that money for better investments. So yeah. on your end, it's a two sentence email. Yeah, that you right, have. right. Yeah, <laughs> no, this is good. Uh, we we got a question. I, we've covered this, but uh, we'll. we'll just want to clarify it. Um, if Elena asks on Facebook, if you're planning or leaving property with a child, can you, or would you put them on the deed or do you keep everything in your LLC and set up the will? I'd like to answer this to make sure I was paying attention to you. Yes, let's um, do it. Okay. So you said, um, no, do not put them on the deed because you want that step up basis, which means they bought it. Let's say you bought the house at a hundred thousand dollars. Uh, when you die and it's now worth $400,000, your children would inherit a $400,000 asset. So if they ever sell it, that's taxed on as if they acquired it at $400,000 rather than $100,000. Uh, and so really what you need is a really good irrevocable trust or, or will. Oh, did I get revocable. that right? Uh, so typically it's a revocable living trust. A revocable, yeah, meaning that you can't edit it. Yeah, yes. uh, a revocable one that basically says, do this with my property upon my death. And then, um, and that's probably, that's much better than doing an LLC with your child with the LLC as well. Yeah, right. And we put it out, uh, if you have an LLC with your kids, it's, it's pretty similar to adding them to the deed, right? Where now part of that ownership of the property is co-owned with the kids. So that portion no longer gets step up basis. So typically, um, you know, the suggestion is the kids are not on the deed and they don't co-own the LLC with you. It's just you, your LLC through your revocable trust 
and then they get everything or you know whatever you want them to get at inheritance. Um, of course, Elena, this depends on your net worth as well, right? So, so people of higher net worth, there are different, more advanced strategies than what we're discussing. Um, are you familiar with sort of like uh, a, a, a permanent syndication where there's like limited partnerships and GPs and, and you know, this could be real estate related, but also yeah. maybe you're investing in a startup business or something like that. Would you, is there benefits to putting them that like, say you, you say you, someone else has an investment property and you want to put a hundred thousand dollars, your credit investor in, in their investment and they're buying an apartment and they're passing around the hat, collecting money. And so if, if you're familiar with this, you're on the limited partnership side. I'm, you're not making any decisions. You're just a passive investor, right? And then your portion of your whatever hundred thousand dollars, you let's say that's two percent of the deal. Then you get two percent of the rental income. Two percent. Is there any tax advantages or strategies to putting that in your personal name, in a business name, in a trust, or anything like that? Yeah, great question. We um, so so we have clients who are syndicators. Uh, who syndicate apartments and mobile homes, and we have clients who are investors, passive investors of syndications. Uh, and I'm a passive investor myself, so I have investments in different syndications. Um, now, wh whether you know, let's say as an investor, whether my own my two percent ownership you mentioned um, needs to be an LLC, uh, probably not. Um, definitely not from a tax perspective. Okay, so I can own it individually. Um, but if I happen to already have an LLC and I want to use it, or I already have a living trust I want to put under my living trust, that's fine too. Um, so same benefit, you know, same deductions, regardless of whether I have it in an entity or not. Okay. The syndication itself is already an LLC, right? right? So there is a level of asset protection there already. Um, but what I love about passive syndication investments is that it, it's pretty hassle-free, you know, at the syndication level, they are, or they should be already doing a lot of the more advanced tax planning. So they're doing all the bonus depreciation, cost segregation to accelerate as much write off as possible. So hopefully for me as an investor, even though I'm getting cash flow, I'm not getting, you know, a, K a K1 showing large taxable income in the early years. Now, um, can you explain depreciation? Because I think a lot of people assume it's the opposite of appreciation. Appreciation meaning that the property went up in value and depreciation, they think, means it goes down in value. And I know that's incorrect, but how do you explain the difference? Yeah, so depreciation is just a tax term. Um, it bears no meaning to the actual market value of a property. Um, basically, the IRS just says, hey, you know, my our assumption is that when you buy a piece of property, the property building has components within that building. And so um, as you own a building over time, it deteriorates, right? Part of the materials, things might break down. And so there's because of that, we can take a tax write off. And that's what's called depreciation. Right. Um, and so when we have a property, let's say we bought a building for one hundred thousand um, dollars. We can take a write off based on that hundred thousand dollar purchase price, irrespective of whether my property is going up in value every year or going down in value. So the depreciation is strictly based on IRS rules. They've set out the the, the you know the timeline of how quickly or how slowly you take depreciation. Um, now within the depreciation world, then there's other. Um, strategies in terms of like, okay, how can we write off more or how can we write off more faster rather than waiting over the next couple of years? And um, this year we still have what's considered 100% bonus depreciation. So that just means certain assets for your real estate, you can write it off immediately rather than having to wait for multiple years. So like appliances, as an example, um, you know, if you if you add an appliance or not or whatnot to your rental property, those are typically eligible for bonus, which means my, you know, $900 refrigerator, I can probably write it all off in this year rather than having to depreciate it over multiple years. Got it. Yeah. And so um, I think residential is 27 and a half years. And so the way I sort of think about it is you buy a house, the IRS thinks it's going to fall apart, or you've got to replace everything over 20, over, within 27 and a half years. And so the regular depreciation is what's what whatever the purchase price is, you subtract the land value, maybe it's a so $100,000 house, probably the land is worth 20,000 20%. So you got an $80,000 asset that you've got to replace every single component with over the next 27 and a half years. So you take 80,000, divide it by 27 and a half, and that is how much you get to depreciate, which, which you know, whatever that number is, let's say it's 2,000 bucks, 
That means if you made 2000 profit that year, you get to take off 2000 for depreciation. So you pay another, it's another way to not pay real estate investors, not to pay taxes. Yeah. Yeah. I like the way you um, describe it. The The other part about depreciation too is, you know, the 27 and a half years is kind of the the, the slow and studied uh, method allowed by the IRS, but you can also do what's called call segregation. And that is where, uh, you, you know, your CPA and an engineering firm can come out and look at this $80,000 building and say, well, it's not just a building. The building is made up of a lot of different things. So there's specialty plumbing, there are drywalls, there's flooring, there's cabinets. And, and once those components are broken out, a lot of those you can take faster depreciation on where I was saying, you know, we have bonus depreciation this year. So maybe out of that $80,000, we said, well, uh, 20,000 of these are, you know, flooring and cabinets and other stuff where we can take bonus on. So your first year write off might be $20,000. And then the rest, you can still take it over 27 and a half years. So very powerful. Um, 2022 is the last year of 100% bonus depreciation. So we do see a lot of investors trying to, you know, hurry up and, and buy properties and put it in service. Um, next year, we still have bonus. Uh, it just kind of goes down to uh, 80% in 2023. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't realize we were up against the clock for this year, but yeah. uh, with that bonus. Um, and and that that's also, correct me if I'm wrong, a, something that if you have multiple properties, this is this works in your benefit because say you have you, you have one property that you're making a ton of money and you're going to have a huge tax bill. And then you have another property where you're like, oh, let me do that bonus depreciation right now so I can have, show a bigger loss uh, because I'm replacing these specialty pipes or whatever. And so it's a year by year thing where you're like, let's look at my portfolio. This this house is making me money. So let me find a property where I can tax purposes right off, have a bit more business expenses as possible. And you're constantly doing this shuffle um, or your accountant is right. Uh, and, yes. and, and, and trying to <laughs> save you on taxes. Yeah, definitely. And people, um, you know, I mean, is the, the, the depreciation helps to offset rental income, right? Whether it's your own properties or maybe you had, you know, your passive investor in another syndication, uh, that had large cash flow or a gain, you can also use the same strategy to offset that other type of rental income too. Um, for certain type of investors who are, you know, what we consider real estate professionals um, or, you know, certain active investors who are dealing in short-term rentals, sometimes you can even utilize rental losses, including all that depreciation and bonus to offset W-2 income or income from other businesses or crypto investments as well, too. So, um, you know, there's a lot of fun planning that you get to do when you're a real estate investor. And so a lot of times people are like, great, I found the deal. I want to do be a real estate investor. I just don't have the money. But what you just said, what I, and, and like, let's, let's say someone, a doctor has a ton of, um, you know, usually a high income, right? Um, and they don't have the time to invest in real estate, you know, but they do want to diversify. Um, they could take some of their savings and invest with a real estate investor. Um, and then that investment with just bonus depreciation and other tax strategies applies to the investor, that, that doctor, as well as to the real estate investor. So that if you're a high income earner, whether you're a doctor, lawyer, whatever income that you can invest in real estate to not only make money on that invest investment, but also make money by saving and writing off and writing down your W-2. Is that accurate? Yeah, it's possible to do. Um, but, you know, <laughs> in the tax world, it's not as simple as just, hey, let me give you my money and get the benefits. Um, so that in your example, that physician or a spouse of theirs, um, if it's we're talking about long term rentals, they do have to qualify as real estate professional status. So, you know, if someone's a full time doctor, that's going to be difficult. But maybe if they have a spouse right, who can do real estate, that could be possible. Um, or if the particular product we're talking about is like a short term rental then they don't have to be a real estate professional, but they do have to, you know, still meet material participation, which in, you know, kind of a high level means they have to be very actively involved in the short term rental property. Um, but yeah, that is something we see a lot, even for someone who doesn't meet those requirements. We do see clients who specifically are physicians um, that have a lot of other passive income, you know, maybe they're a doctor, but they also invest in a very profitable um, dialysis center or surgery center, right? And so they can use rental income or rental losses that are passive to offset a lot of those types of investment income too. Um, so yeah, very powerful and fun things to be done with real estate. 
Yeah, no, th this is fun. And, and so you're an investor as well, it sounds like. What sort of real estate investing do you get into? And, and do you do it because of the tax reasons or just are you, are you in it for other reasons? Both, both. I mean, for taxes and, you know, cash flow, right? Another other uh, multiple streams of income, um, appreciation plays. Uh, most of our stuff is <laughs> pretty boring stuff. I'm, I'm from Las Vegas originally. And um, so our family has a lot of investments in Vegas. And, you know, we've also got our own investments in Vegas, too. Um, just, you know, traditional long term hold type of things, nothing too fancy. Um, but I also do um, I invest passively in a lot of syndications as well. Yeah. My next day, I think I'm I'm really interested in doing short term rentals. So yeah. that's on my to do list. Oh, fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, I know Vegas or Nevada has, from what I understand, zero property tax. Uh, there is property tax. There's zero income tax. Zero income tax. OK. Yeah, yeah. Is there any place <laughs> out there with zero property tax? No, mm, not no. that I know of, although okay. Nevada has very low property tax as well. So a lot of the states um, like Texas who have no income tax, yes. no state income tax has high property tax because the pri property taxes kind of make up for, you know, the what the, the state's revenue needs. Um, Nevada, one of the benefits of Nevada is that the gaming, the gaming board yeah. um, pays a lot of taxes for the state. So 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 we have, um, you know, no income tax as well as very low property tax. <laughs> so, so this is my ignorance, but this is what I'm hearing, which I doesn't sound right to me in my head. Sure. Um, I created LLC uh, and um, in Nevada, my business is in Nevada. It makes me money. That income, when you say no uh, income tax, what, what, what does that mean? Like I don't pay tax on that income. It, it, so no state income tax. It okay. just means that you know you're that you don't have to tax. pay Nevada state income tax, okay. right? Okay. So like for California, for example, if you make a hundred dollars taxable income, you pay federal income taxes, and you also pay California income taxes. Okay. okay. But a same person living in Nevada, they just pay federal income taxes. They, there is no Nevada state income tax. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's something. <laughs> but I like what you were thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, that, that, that doesn't, I, I knew that wasn't right. I, I've never lived in a state with no income tax. So um, it, now um, this is this is maybe not a question that you can answer, but I see a lot of these sort of like crypto millionaires and guys, and, and uh, I don't know if it really applies to real estate investors, but what they do is they go buy property or some sort of U.S. territory and from what I, they, with the way that they're pre preaching on social media and TikTok and things, it seems almost too good to be true. But the the, the story, the, the 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 dream that they're selling is if you live there for um, whatever 186 days out of the year or something like that, um, you you kind of have tax advantages. Uh, it, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I I mean I have a very limited understanding of what you're talking about right. uh, because yes, we do have um, I, I do have colleagues who work in that arena. Uh, not our firm, we don't specialize in kind yeah. of the offshore tax planning. Uh, but yes, those opportunities do exist. Um, you know, they're a lot more complex, right? Because you're talking about more, um, you know, offshore type of entities and things like that in order to shift income. Um, so yes, it does work as far as I understand it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you just have to, you have to have a, a pretty significant amount of income and net worth to justify the cost of setting something like that up. Yeah. And, and yeah, moving to, yeah, exactly. And, and moving that. your like, family. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I guess the dream they're selling, like, I think it has income tax breaks and, and things like that. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, whatever. But, you know, everyone spends their story uh, to, to seem like, like, you should be doing this. And like, <laughs> Should I be? It sounds a little bit too good to be true. We don't really see that in the real estate world. Like you said, you know, for cryptos and, and yeah. other types of businesses, um, it's more common. In real estate, we don't see that too much because real estate already is a tax preferred vehicle anyway, right? So if you're mm -hmm. someone who's buying real estate, consistently buying real estate, odds are you're paying very little taxes, um, at least on the real estate piece, right? Very little right. to no taxes. So, so it doesn't, you know, there's not really like an, an added benefit to move to a different country if you can already control the, your U.S. taxes through real estate. So what's your familiarity with crypto in the United States? Uh, 
<laughs> more than I want to be, <laughs> you know, um, because our firm, we specialize in working with real estate investors. So right. most of our clients are, um, you know, people who either already are investing in real estate or people who are, you know, at least determined that real estate is going to be a, a significant part of their portfolio going forward. And so for the longest time, I told people, hey, you know, um, we do real estate. So I don't, you know, I'm not really an expert on crypto uh, currency, but I will tell you this past year, um, a big percentage of our real estate clients have dabbled in cryptocurrency. So that's why I say I probably know a little bit more than I, I wanted to. But yeah. well, I, I, I'm one of those people. And I, I think it's the mindset of what you like, what I love about real estate, the passive income, the wheeling, the dealing that that like I led with at the start of the episode. You, you get that in crypto, you know, yeah. it, it's, it's similar sort of, oh, this could be passive income. This is exciting. You know, it's probably, well, it's definitely a little bit more gambling than, than in crypto than there, there is in, in real estate, but it, it's an excitement and it's, um, it, it's building long-term wealth, potentially um, yeah. very passive in many ways. So I, I see why I think it, it your, your clients being real estate <laughs> investors for the most part, the, 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 this is probably a conversation that's going to come up more and more. I would yeah, imagine. definitely. Um, and, you know, I, I, the, 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 the thing we see a lot of clients who maybe made money in crypto and are, are wanting to put it into real estate, right? Something more stable in their eyes. And so newer investors moving money from crypto to real estate. Um, but I, you know, the, the, the hurdle just, you know, technically speaking for CPAs, um, a lot of my colleagues outside of our firm too, is that the tax code um, with respect to crypto is so new and there's so many unknowns, so many things that still have to be clarified so we all understand what is intent, what is the law trying to do. Uh, and that's the part that's, you know, a little bit uncomfortable. Real estate's been around for forever. Mm -hmm. We all know the rules. It's There's nothing super gray about what the rules are, how to do depreciation, how to treat certain things. Um, and just not that way, in, you know, in the crypto taxation yet, but Got hopefully it. soon. Yeah, no, I hear you. Um, okay, let's, let's um, wrap this up a little bit by telling me a little bit about the books you've written and who, who they're for. <laughs> um, so we, uh, the first book that my husband and I wrote was uh, Tax Strategies for the Savvy Real Estate Investor. Um, and what <laughs> the reason we wrote it was because, you know, we are always reading ourselves, you know, trying to learn what are some strategies that maybe other CPAs are teaching, um, continue education basically for us. And then we just realized that a lot of these books are putting us to sleep. And I thought, you know, if I'm a CPA and if the tax books are putting me to sleep, I can imagine what the everyday investor is getting out of those books. So we we decided to write a book that was um, an easier read for people. And effectively, it's just a bunch of stories, um, real life client stories where we shared um, how tax planning can work and how what happens when it works well, as well as kind of horror stories about tax planning done wrong or people mm -hmm. who didn't do the correct planning. Um, and so, yeah, we got some good feedback that people, you know, understand the concepts being taught. And uh, so our second book is called The Book on Advanced Tax Strategies, a little bit more advanced, like the title sounds. So probably, you know, for someone who's owned a couple rental properties um, before they tackle that that second book. Yeah. No, I've, I've read the first one. It's good. Um, and I'm with you. I like writing books that don't put people to sleep. That's, that's always <laughs> yeah. been, you know, a lot of real estate investing books do the same thing. So I, I understand where you're coming from. Um, and what's the name of your CP? A firm and how can people find you? Sure. Our company's uh, name is called Keystone CPA and you can find us. Uh, the best place to find us is probably online. Um, we have a free downloadable ebook. If you didn't want to buy the actual book from Amazon, you can get the, the mini version. Um, and it's called Five Tax Strategies for Real Estate Investors. And we talk a lot about um, most common uh, strategies like legal entity, right? What, what do I need to consider before forming an entity? Um, how do I pay my kids and take a tax write-off? Um, or, you know, how do I use real estate to offset my W-2 income for certain taxpayers? So you can check that out. It's um, uh, downloadable from our website at keystonecpa.com. And I, I, what I like is I feel like working with you, it's like, I wouldn't know to ask those questions, like, like, and, but you would, you would consult your clients and say, Hey, you, you should be doing this. And, and like, you're, you're being the proactive sort of angel on the shoulder saying, you know, you didn't know to ask these questions. Let, let me, and, and 
let me help you. Am I right there? Yeah. I mean, as an investor, your job is not really to ask the questions because like you said, you don't know what questions to ask. Your, your mm -hmm. job is not to ask the questions and your job is not to have to provide the strategies, right? So if you're finding yourself like, hey, you're listening to this podcast and now you have to email your CPA and say, can you tell me about real estate professional? Can you talk to me about depreciation? Then you have the wrong person, right? Because yeah, that's right. the the thing that your tax person is supposed to bring to you. Your only job when it comes to taxes is to, to keep the line of communications open and update your tax person on what you're thinking, what you're planning to do. And from there, they can help add the value to what your options are and how that those things can help you. Got it. So Amanda Han, uh, Keystone CPA, you, you are in California, but you work with clients nationwide? Yeah, yeah, we do have clients all over the US, um, you know, that invest in all different places too, right? People who live in Florida investing in Tennessee and vice versa. Um, so yeah, all over the US. All right. Well, this has been great. I've learned a lot. And uh, I, 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 I have a to do list now that of stuff that I've thought I need to do these things, but you've, you've really solidified the, the direction and the path for me to go and, and really take this planning. So thank you uh, for, for being on the house of AC, sharing your wisdom and your books are great and looking forward to uh, staying in touch and, and hearing all, all, all the other strategies you come up with. And I definitely want to hear how the short-term rentals go for you in the future. Yes. Love to come back. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, thanks for listening to the House of AC, guys. This is sponsored by Jasmine Mortgage Team. If you're looking for a refinance or your first purchase, primary or investment, jasminemortgageteam.com. Please go there. That is where I go to get my own personal mortgages on all my properties as well. So uh, I can give them two thumbs up. Uh, you're going to get the best of the best over at Jasmine Mortgage Team. Thanks for tuning in to the House of AC. We'll see you next time.